Hello and welcome to Chicago's Union Station. Today we are riding on Amtrak's Texas Eagle from Chicago down to Austin in the comfort of a roomette. Covering a total of 1,223 miles over two days of travel, today's journey will be the longest on the channel to date. With some wild weather, incredible sights, and a great overall experience, it stands as one of my favorite journeys on Amtrak so far. So sit back and relax and join me on Amtrak's Texas Eagle. Our journey begins outside of Chicago's Union Station, the northeastern terminus of the Texas Eagle and Amtrak's gateway to the west. Opened in 1925, Union Station is the fourth busiest rail station in the United States, Amtrak's fourth busiest station across the network, and the busiest Amtrak station outside of the Northeast Corridor. Making our way into the west side of the station brings us into the Great Hall, by far the most beautiful portion of Union Station. Located at the center of the station head house, the Great Hall spans an enormous 20,972 square feet, with a vaulted skylight 115 feet above the waiting room floor. The hall today wears a bit of extra decoration, adorned with an American flag and red, white, and blue lighting in honor of the 4th of July. Traveling in a room on Amtrak has other perks outside of the room itself. At select stations across the network, Amtrak offers lounges to sleeper and business class passengers with same-day tickets. The same-day rule allows passengers with tickets much later in the day or those who just got off their train to gain access to the lounge, which is great if you need a bit of respite before or after a long day of travel. The Metropolitan Lounge at Union Station isn't as flashy as the one at Moynihan in New York, but it's quite large and offers some decent amenities including a business center, luggage storage, snacks and drinks, and showers. Snacks can be found at the bar upon entering the lounge. Offered are a selection of pre-packaged light snacks, including Pop-Tarts, Oreos, Brownies, and Oatmeal. Hot drinks include coffee, regular and decaf, plus hot water for tea. It's not a ton of options, and notably there aren't any savory options included, but hey, it's complimentary. Really, the lounge is used more as a safe haven from the chaos of Union Station than it is as a place to snag a free meal. Taking a look around, there are plenty of couches and comfortable armchairs for passengers to relax in. Upstairs is more of the same, however it's much quieter up here as it's secluded from the flow of passengers in and out of the lounge. As I overheard from a discussion between a passenger and the lounge attendant, lunch wouldn't be served heading out of Chicago, despite our 1.45 departure time. This means we'll have to source a meal from the Union Station food court. The food court has a few different meal options, although they're mostly fast food, with stalls from the likes of McDonald's, Chick-fil-A, and Jersey Mike's. Returning to the lounge, the boarding announcement is made for Texas Eagle Train 21, so we grab our belongings and head down the tunnel towards the tracks. Waiting for us on track 22 is Amtrak's Texas Eagle, and upon arrival, we're instructed to head down the train to the first car, the only sleeper on today's train. Unfortunately, the Texas Eagle consist was cut down at the start of the pandemic to just a single sleeper, a cafe car, and three coach cars, one of which will be cut upon our arrival into St. Louis. This means no lounge car, and more importantly, no traditional dining on our journey today. After waiting in line for a few minutes and checking in with our sleeper attendant, we can climb aboard Amtrak's Texas Eagle. Our room today doesn't have a ton of space, so we'll drop off our bag at the luggage racks before climbing the stairs to the second level. Heading down the corridor, we can find Room 6, our home for the next 28 hours. Stepping inside, we can close the door and get comfortable for the long ride ahead. As we get situated, Amtrak's California Zephyr pulls in on track 26. Running from Chicago to Emeryville, just east of San Francisco, the California Zephyr crosses seven states and 2,400 miles over 51 hours. 
The Zephyr is a high priority on my list of future journeys, with the Empire Builder and Southwest Chief keeping it company, all three of which I plan on taking next year. We don't have to wait long after boarding before our train pulls out of Union Station, beginning our 1200 mile adventure down south. Exiting the tunnels below Chicago, Amtrak's Chicago Yard fills the foreground, the Chicago skyline standing tall on the horizon. Passing under the St. Charles Airline Bridge and over the Chicago River, we leave downtown Chicago behind, heading out into the suburbs and beyond. Before we head too far from our origin, let's take a look at our route over the next two days. Our journey begins heading south out of Chicago, crossing Joliet and following I-55 through central Illinois to Springfield, reaching St. Louis, Missouri before sunset. We continue on from St. Louis, following the Mississippi River to Festus, moving inland past Pilot Knob, crossing into Arkansas under the cover of darkness. Arkansas is traversed almost entirely overnight, stopping in Little Rock around 3 a.m., with Texarkana three hours later. The sun meets us the following morning as we cruise through East Texas, arriving in Dallas and later Fort Worth around noon and 1 respectively. Our journey continues south from there, passing Kleber, Meridian, Temple, and Taylor before reaching the outskirts of Austin, arriving downtown at 6.22 p.m. We'll cover a total of 1,223 miles across four states with a travel time of 28 hours and 37 minutes. What had been a gloomy departure turned a darker gray, with rain starting as we stopped in Joliet. Joliet is the last stop in the greater Chicago area, serving Amtrak, Lincoln Services, Missouri River Runner, and the Texas Eagle, plus Metro's Rock Island and Heritage Corridor trains. The rain wasn't too bad as we got moving again, letting up a bit as we crossed the Kankakee River, but a look at the radar showed that the worst was yet to come. Turning away from the window, we can take a look at our Amtrak roomette. Amtrak's roomette is the smallest sleeper accommodation offered on board, and includes two bunks with enough space for two adults. With a total footprint of 6.5 by 3.5 feet, roomettes offer little space to begin with, the majority of which is taken up by the two seats. Between the two seats are two water bottles, the tray table, safety information card, and the menu for our journey. The tray table lifts up and folds out across the space between each seat and is large enough to hold a laptop or two, but could definitely use a good clean. The table also sits a little too low for it to be usable as it rests on my knees while I'm seated. Amtrak provides two complimentary water bottles with one for each passenger. If you run out, the sleeper attendant won't hesitate to bring you more, so all you have to do is ask. The menu for our flexible dining options on today's trip is found just behind the safety information card. We'll go into further detail on the options when it's time for dinner. Moving on to the seating, for one passenger there's more than enough space between each seat to stretch out and get comfortable. Pulling on the bar beneath each seat reclines the seat back into a comfortable lounging position, although with two passengers and both seats reclined, there really isn't enough space for both people to sit comfortably. The rearward seat includes a reading light, the room's temperature controls, and the only outlet for the entire room. Yes, the only outlet. For two passengers who likely have one or more devices, having a single outlet is not nearly enough. One per seat would have definitely been preferable, but this single outlet is unacceptable. The forward seat includes its own reading light, plus the volume controls for the PA announcements and music, which didn't work, plus the attendant call button and master light controls. Each seat comes with a single pillow, which is pretty comfortable. Storage space is extremely limited, with barely enough space for my backpack and camera bag. To the side of the rearward seat is the only official storage space, with a deep but narrow hold for personal belongings. 
Measuring with my fingers, it's only about 7 inches wide, which can accommodate only the smallest of bags. Luggage taller or wider than the cubby can be tied down using the strap provided. There's also a bit of storage space in between the stairs leading up to the top bunk. Above the storage space are two coat hangers with complementary towels in the cubbies below the light fixture. The ceiling also features the AC vent, which can be controlled using the aforementioned temperature controls on the rearward seat in the flow lever to the side. Beneath the stairs to the top bunk is the room's trash can, sliding in and out for easy use. The single large window can be covered up using the blinds on either side of the room, connecting in the middle with a bit of Velcro. Above the seating area is the top bunk, which folds down when needed. The top bunk holds the bedding for the lower bunk and the blankets for both passengers. The instructions for the top bunk say to roll into it with your head away from the stairs, but I found it was much easier to get in the other way around. The top bunk is shorter than the bottom by around 4 inches, but I still had enough space to lay down without touching the walls at either the head or the foot of the bed. The frame does intrude into the sleeping space at either end, so I highly recommend the lower bunk for taller passengers. For safety, the top bunk includes a net which hooks into the ceiling. The straps on either side can be tightened, however they're quite finicky to deal with. A reading light for the top bunk is built into the ceiling next to the AC vent with a small bag for personal belongings on the outer wall. If window views are your thing, then the top bunk definitely isn't for you. Only a sliver of the window can be seen through the crack between the bunk and the wall, and with the blinds closed, that space is reduced to almost nothing. The Roomette is a great choice for solo travelers looking for some private space on longer journeys, but for two adults it would be quite cramped. For those looking for more space, Amtrak also offers regular and family bedrooms, both of which are much larger than a Roomette and feature ensuite bathrooms and showers, one of which we'll have the opportunity to look at a bit later. If you're enjoying the video so far, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free, and it really helps support the channel. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then check out the channel's Patreon. If you want your name in the video, access to exclusive weekly posts, and even the opportunity to vote on future videos, then click the link in the top right or in the description below to learn more. Just down the hallway from our room is the drink station on our sleeper. For the time being, only water is offered, but come tomorrow morning, the pot here will be filled with fresh hot coffee. Heading south through Illinois, our train picks up speed along the Illinois High-Speed Rail Corridor. The Illinois High-Speed Rail Corridor runs from Chicago through central Illinois to St. Louis. In the past, trains would operate at top speeds of 79 miles per hour, but began operating at 90 miles per hour in 2019. The end goal is track speeds of 110 miles per hour, which would save around an hour of travel time between Chicago and St. Louis. Higher speed testing is already underway, with trains expected to begin operation at 110 sometime in 2023. Although technically not high speed, it's still an upgrade from the usual inner city 80 mile per hour service, and is definitely a step in the right direction for higher speed rail in the United States. Rain began to fall as we made our stop in Pontiac, lightning flashing every few seconds as a warning of what was to come. We crept out of Pontiac, continuing south as the rain picked up. 500 feet of visibility soon became 50 and then 10 as the heavens opened, dumping buckets upon buckets of water across the landscape. What had been tolerable soon became too much, forcing our train to stop while we wait out the storm. The weather radar showed that we were right in the thick of it and that we'd be here for a while.
Outside, it was nothing but rain and wind, the sheets of water blowing across the Illinois fields, thunder crashing all around us. rain eventually died down and we were back on the move, the skies lightening up as the storm cell moved east. By the time we reached Lincoln, the weather had cleared up entirely with nothing but blue skies as far as the eye could see. Superliner roomettes do not include ensuite bathrooms, which means passengers must venture down the hall or downstairs to find the restroom. The upstairs bathroom is small but functional, with a basic sink and toilet. The sink worked well with hot and cold water, although the soap was almost empty. The paper towels were well stocked, but the tissues were empty and the toilet paper was almost entirely gone. The single outlet did appear to be in good working order, with plenty of cups next to the door. To the right of the mirror is a coat hook and a towel rack to hang the complimentary washcloth from each room. Overall, it's okay as far as bathrooms go, but it could do with a good clean and really needed to be restocked. I made sure to tell the sleeper attendant about the stock issues, so hopefully it would be fixed for the next passenger. Meals and water are complimentary for sleeper passengers, but one aspect of traveling on Amtrak that is often overlooked is that no snacks are provided in between meals. Fortunately, I stocked up on a few options plus a can of Coke that I snagged from the Metropolitan Lounge while in Chicago. Snacks can be purchased from the cafe car, but passengers are limited to the small and pricey selection offered on board, so I highly recommend making a snack stop before boarding. Springfield is our next major station stop. Normally, Springfield would be a smoke stop, allowing us to step off and get some fresh air. But because of our weather delay earlier, today's stop is reduced to a regular one to make up time. Departing Springfield, we get an amazing shot of the Illinois State Capitol as we cross East Capitol Avenue. Carlinville is our next stop, and around this time, our sleeper attendant comes through to take our dinner order and dining time. As I mentioned earlier, we'd be dining off of Amtrak's flexible dining menu, which unfortunately means we don't get nearly as many options as we would on other long-distance routes. I had heard good things about the Thai Red Curry street noodles in the past, so I ordered that for dinner tonight. After cruising through rural Illinois for a bit, our dinner time arrived and we can head over to the dining car. In the dining car, the tables had been laid out with each room's meal, plus a card to indicate which room it was for. The dinner spread didn't look super appetizing in its cardboard box, but unpacking everything revealed a fairly pleasant meal. Included with our meal was a side salad with ranch dressing and a roll, plus ginger ale to drink. For dessert, passengers are offered a chocolate chip brownie. The salad is very basic, but it's a nice, healthy addition to the meal. The main, however, is surprisingly tasty, with a flavorful blend of spices and, of course, Thai chili peppers for a powerful kick. The vegetables were well-seasoned, and the Impossible Meatballs were savory and delicious. If I had one critique for this dish, it would be that it needed more sauce. The sauce itself was really tasty, but there just wasn't enough of it to dress all of the noodles, leaving some at the bottom of the bowl sauceless. The brownie was a great way to wrap up the meal. It was super rich with massive chocolate chunks throughout. Despite the lack of a traditional dining car, I have to say the flexible dining, at least for dinner, was surprisingly good. 
My expectations were low going into it, but the Thai street noodles were great, and the brownie brought everything to a satisfying close. As dinner wrapped up, the skyline of St. Louis began to grow on the horizon, the gateway arch peeking out above the treetops. I know I have said in the past that the northbound arrival into Austin is among the best on Amtrak's network, but this really is something else. As our train rounded the bend across the MacArthur Bridge, we're met with an unbelievable view of the St. Louis skyline, the Gateway Arch, and the mighty Mississippi. The St. Louis Gateway Arch stands at an incredible 630 feet tall and is the tallest accessible building in the state of Missouri. The massive structure was built back in the 1960s and cost $13 million to complete, or around $83 million in today's dollars. Crossing the Mississippi brings us out of Illinois and into Missouri, the second of four states on our journey. Passing downtown in the St. Louis Light Rail, we arrive at St. Louis Gateway Station right on time. St. Louis is the second listed smoke stop, but the first one where we'll have an opportunity to step off the train for some fresh air. Stepping out onto the platforms, we get our first real look at our full train. Heading our train today is the nicest of locomotives, Amtrak P42 DC number 69. In tow are five Superliner coaches, although that would soon change. St. Louis marks the end of our five-car consist, as the last car will be removed from the train for the remainder of the journey. While out on the platforms, I met a fellow train buff named Steve, where he and I traded stories of rail travel on Amtrak. Steve, if you're watching this, it was a pleasure to meet you, and I hope that you're doing well. The conductor sounds the all aboard, and we step back inside to continue the journey. As if the world knew what day it was, a single American flag stood high above the surrounding buildings in a star-spangled salute to the birth of the United States. Sunset came not long after leaving St. Louis, painting the sky in gorgeous pinks and oranges. We met the mighty Mississippi right at dusk, riding south along the banks until Peevely. The 4th of July celebrations began as darkness took over, the fireworks illuminating the night sky. Before we turn in for the night, we need to get cleaned up, which means it's shower time. The shower for room at passengers is located on the bottom floor next to the accessible bedroom. The shower room is divided into two spaces, a changing area and the shower stall, neither of which are particularly large. The changing area includes the trash can, plenty of fresh towels, a coat hook, and a towel rack. The shower is fairly basic with a detachable shower head and a temperature control. Next to the shower head are some fairly basic instructions, although they're not really necessary as there's not much to get wrong. The stall is tall enough for me to stand up in, however the standard mounting point for the shower head is too low for me, so the detachable head is greatly appreciated. The water pressure was surprisingly high, especially for a train, and both the warm and cold adjustment worked well enough to get it to a comfortable temperature. Despite being a shower, Amtrak did not provide any shampoo or soap, so there's no real way to get properly clean. 
I made sure to snag some toiletries from my hotel the night prior, so I was good to go, but be sure to bring your own if you plan on taking advantage of the shower on board. All in all, it's not perfect, but it's certainly welcome after a long day of traveling. Having cleaned up, I called in our sleeper attendant to convert our seats into the bed for the night. The process only takes a few minutes, and before long, we're ready to get some rest. As the 4th of July fireworks rang out in the background, we can climb into bed and turn out the lights. We awoke the next morning at our station stop in Texarkana, and based on where the platforms are located, are only moments in the state of Arkansas. Departing Texarkana, we cross over into Texas, making headway south towards Austin. Breakfast was next on the agenda. Breakfast is served a little differently than lunch or dinner, with passengers ordering at the bar instead of through the sleeper attendant. The flexible menu offers three options for breakfast, a continental breakfast which includes a selection of different items, railroad french toast, or a three-egg omelette. I chose the omelette and a bowl of Rice Krispies to eat, plus a cup of coffee to drink. Peeling back the foil reveals a large omelette with some potatoes, sun-dried tomatoes, and a couple of chicken sausage links. The meal wasn't really anything to write home about. The omelet was kind of bland, but the potatoes and sausage were alright, and it was definitely enough food for one person. And with the addition of the Rice Krispies, it made for a filling breakfast. Now, those who ride Amtrak frequently may know that the Rice Krispies are not a part of the omelet breakfast. However, if you ask the cafe car attendant, they'll be more than happy to give you something from the Continental Breakfast selection. Having just finished up breakfast, our train pulls into Longview for the first smoke stop of the day. Locomotive 69 has certainly seen better days, with scratches and dents across her front end. It looks like she may have been in some kind of accident at some point, as there's a fair bit of damage to her front left corner just beyond the Illinois high-speed rail tag. On our way back on board, I spot a bit of railroading history. Hidden beneath the welcome text is the silhouette of the Amtrak West logo, a branding which hasn't been used for many decades. Now that morning has come, the drink station has been replenished with a full pot of freshly brewed coffee. Rural Texas rolls past the window, and we're soon arriving in Dallas for our next smoke stop. In addition to the Texas Eagle, Dallas's Union Station plays host to the Trinity Railway Express to Fort Worth and the Dart Light Rail Red and Blue Lines. After a quick stop in Dallas, we hop back on board to make our way over to Fort Worth. The DFW area is where the Texas Eagles schedule gets a little weird. Both Dallas and Fort Worth, just an hour west of here, are smoke stops, with Fort Worth being a crew change point. This results in a long stop here in Dallas, and then an even longer stop in Fort Worth. Looking at the schedule, we'll be stationary in Fort Worth for almost two hours, which is a bit ridiculous. Lunchtime came as we were approaching Fort Worth. For lunch today, I ordered the baked ziti and meatballs with a Coke to drink. As with dinner the previous night, our meal came with a side salad and a roll, plus a brownie for dessert. The salad and roll were pretty standard stuff. The baked ziti was alright, although I think it had been a bit overcooked, as most of the moisture from the sauce had been boiled off. Noodles from last night. Right as we began to dig in, our train pulled into Fort Worth. As we did so, our conductor made an announcement letting us know that we would be stationary here for around an hour and a half, or until 2.10pm. Wrapping up lunch, we can step out into the Texas sunlight. Fort Worth is the southern terminus for Amtrak's Heartland Flyer up to Oklahoma City. The three-car train runs once a day in either direction, connecting passengers with Oklahoma City and thruway services up to the Southwest Chief. Fort Worth is also the point at which the north and southbound trains cross paths. 
Train 22 is in the early stages of its run up to Chicago and interestingly includes a baggage car among the usual consist of superliners. Two ten comes quicker than I had anticipated, and before we know it, we're moving again, making our way south towards Austin. The rural Texas landscape flies past, made all the better by a fresh cup of coffee. While exploring the rest of our sleeper, I noticed that one of the bedrooms was unoccupied, so let's take a quick look at what Amtrak's next step up has to offer. For starters, there's a lot more space than a roomette, taking up almost three quarters the width of the car. With a capacity of four adults, the bunks are much wider than our roomette, with the bottom creating a long couch instead of two separate seats, plus a single chair by the window for extra seating. Bedrooms include an ensuite bathroom, sink, and shower, which is a huge step up from our room. The sink is in a bit of a strange place in the middle of the room, but it's a small price to pay for a private bathroom. The bathroom shower combination is located behind the sink. Because it shares space with the toilet, the shower doesn't include a lot of extra space to get clean, but it's much better than a shared facility like the one downstairs. The price difference is the main hindrance behind this room, at least for a solo traveler. For our roomette from Chicago to Austin, I paid around $500, which isn't bad for the distance covered with meals included and a private room. For the same journey, the bedroom was around three dollars to $400 more expensive, a price difference that really can't be justified when traveling alone. If you're splitting the cost across three or four individuals, then the extra space is definitely worth it, as a roomette with even two people seems uncomfortable. Temple is next up on our stops today, and as with the trend through Texas, is yet another smoke stop. The Temple Railroad and Heritage Museum is located just beyond the platform and is home to multiple historic coaches and locomotives, including BNSF EMD GP9U Locomotive No. 1680 and Santa Fe Alco HH600 No. 2301. Dinner time came about an hour after Temple. Making our way over to the dining car, we find a table with our meal laid out before us. The pasta from lunch had left me dissatisfied, so I went back to the tried and true Thai red curry noodles with a bottle of iced tea to drink. I'm glad I went with the noodles again, as they were delicious even a second time round. The meatless meatballs were savory and well-spiced, and that Thai red curry sauce was again wonderful, with a spicy kick to give everything a bit of extra flavor. Overall, a great way to round out our journey. Rural Texas turned suburban and then urban as we made our way down the center of Austin's Mopac Highway towards our destination. Before we arrive in Austin, a few closing thoughts on our journey. Overall, for the $500 I paid, I have to say it was absolutely worth the money. The room was enough space for me and with complimentary meals and excellent service, it was a relaxing and entertaining way to end off what had been an intense week of traveling. Now, of course, it wasn't perfect. The lack of a lounge car and traditional dining, two of the best parts of the Amtrak experience, was a huge letdown. But the flexible dining meals were surprisingly tasty, and I probably wouldn't have spent much time in the lounge regardless of if it was there or not. Would I recommend the journey? Well, it depends. If you live along the corridor where the Texas Eagle is the only train, then yes, I would. It's a fun experience for relatively cheap, especially for rail fans and sleeper train enthusiasts. Outside of that, I would recommend taking one of Amtrak's other western long-distance routes. The traditional dining and lounge cars add so much to the travel experience that if you have the opportunity to take a train with them, then you should. I anticipate that Amtrak will add the dining and lounge cars back to the consist in the new year, but until then, the Texas Eagle really doesn't stand up to what it used to be. The Austin skyline comes into view on the horizon, and 28 hours and 30 minutes after having left Chicago, our train arrives in Austin, Texas. Grabbing our belongings from the room, we can head down the stairs and disembark for the last time. Next week, we'll be back in the Northeast for a business class ride on Amtrak's Northeast Regional from Providence, Rhode Island to New London, Connecticut. 
If you're new around here, I would really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button down below. It's totally free and it really helps support the channel. There's a lot more incredible content on the way, so stick around if you want to see more. If you want to go the extra mile with your support, then check out the channel's Patreon. If you want your name in the video, access to exclusive weekly posts, and even the opportunity to vote on future videos, then click the link in the top right or in the description below to learn more. But anyways, that's all I have for today. Thanks for riding with me, and I'll see you in the next one.